This is a 2 p.m. Boomer Tech Adventures Facebook Live broadcast. If you've been checking in this week, you know that Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, Chris Toy has been sharing some wonderful cooking ideas with us. And uh, this past Tuesday and Thursday, I've concentrated on the iPhone or iPad camera and especially looking at how to set focus and exposure and when to use HDR. So today we're going to put all that advice together and we're going to look at some tips for taking great photos. I do want to have a disclaimer. I'm not a professional photographer. I just like to have fun. And when I go on vacation or, or out and about, I tend to take pictures left and right. Chris and I have presented on this topic to garden clubs, Boomer Tech Adventure workshops, adult ed. And we've gathered tips from a variety of professional photographers and artists. <coughs> Excuse me. The examples are our own. And we don't uh, claim that they are a professional grade, but we're just out there having fun, which uh, we suspect most of our followers and friends do. So let's get started. I'd suggest that you grab your iPhones and or your iPads and follow along. Uh, you might want to try out uh, some of the ideas, even just if you're sitting in your living room. And uh, at one point we are going to be going to settings, so you might want uh, to be able to have that right there. Now, the hints that we're talking about are the following. The rule of thirds, the leading line, perspective, the subject's gaze is not at you, reflections, frames, and details of flora and fauna. Let's get a little more specific. The experts on photography say when we're thinking about the composition of our images, we want to think about the balance in the picture, the symmetry, and how things line up, the alignment. And these composition tips will help us think about all of those things as we are out walking or traveling or just in our yard. And of course, the whole point is to capture the viewer's interest or to capture something special to oneself. So let's look at the rule of thirds first. It suggests that we want to think about the key elements of the subject of your photograph and to place them at an intersection of the grid. Now the grid may be imaginary in your mind or, as I'm going to show you in a minute, you can actually set up a grid to help you compose. So if you look at uh, the picture on the left, this wonderful colorful dragon, the eye is a pretty strong focal point. And you can see that Chris positioned that eye in the upper left hand uh, quadrant where the two grid lines meet. In the picture on the right, we see a wonderful hummingbird, which I read are on their way back to Maine. And uh, once again, thinking about the composition, by placing that hummingbird at the intersection of, on the right hand side, we also see we're focused there, but we also see how small it is in comparison to everything around it with the background of the house, um, the house behind it. So think about your rule of thirds. Now, some of you may already have your grid turned on. Let's see how you do it. Whoop, wrong way. Sorry about that. Here we go. So if you don't have grid lines, what you're going to do is you're going to go to settings. I'll give you 10 seconds to get there. Okay. 
And when you get to settings, you're going to scroll down. You have to scroll quite a ways to see where it says camera. And you're going to tap on that line. Now, the image on the left is from my iPhone. Sometimes the screens are not identical depending on which phone you have or which iPad you have. But they do all have one thing in common, which is the grid. And you can see that I have mine turned on. Uh, I've taught on the toggle switch, I've tapped it when it was all white, and now it's green. So when I go back to my camera app, which you see on the right, and I've covered up the lens so you just see the grid, you can see what the grid looks like. It's pretty light, it's not um, distracting, but it is there as a, a guide. Now, people have asked me in adult ed classes, well, I, I don't want those lines in my pictures. I, say, I assure them that no, 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 no. Those grid lines only show up while you're composing your picture. Once you trip that shutter, you won't see those grid lines in your image. Now, the good thing about settings is that you or I have great control. So if I don't want to use the grid, I can just turn it off or I can turn it on. So if you've never used the grid when you're composing your pictures, I encourage you to try it. If you don't like it, you can always go back into settings and turn it off. Moving on. The second tip and this is something that draws your eye into picture, are leading lines. Now if you look at the picture on the left and you see that walkway that's been constructed by the logs, notice how that just takes your eye right into the picture and you can almost imagine yourself walking into those woods across that water perhaps hearing um, the chirpings of woodland creatures, hopefully not the roar of a big woodland creature. And the picture on the right, and I hope Chris will in the comments tell us where this is. I'm pretty sure it was on one of his trips to Asia. It's an art installation, but again, notice those panels create a line right into the center of the photograph and it causes our eyes just to follow it. Now if you look around your house, if you have uh, any of them ha use this technique of something that leads the eye into the picture. It may be a, a wall, it may be a river, uh, it may be a line of hills or a line of animals, uh, but usually landscape artists we'll use something uh, that will help take our eyes into the picture. Here's two more examples. Uh, the one on the left, in this case, the leading lines are pilings of a dock. Uh, for those of you who live in the Midcoast area of Maine, uh, I was at Erica's Seafood Takeout. Um, the owner is one of my former students, and it's a beautiful, um, location and great food and uh, can look across to uh, the other side of Harpswell, the islands. The picture on the right, the leading line, actually there are two. There's the sand pathway and the stone wall, which again, my, my purpose was to say, okay, we can go for a walk. I want my viewer to think about going for a walk along the seashore this old New England stone wall and uh, beach grass next to me and walking through the sand. That was the image or the concept I hoped to capture. Um, if you're curious where this is, this was taken down at Winslow Park in Freeport. Now, our third thing to think about is the horizon. Again, if you read about horizons from the artists and photographers, they often suggest that you shouldn't aim for the center of the picture with the horizon. In other words, it should be off-center. In the case on the left, we're looking at the Grand Canyon where we really want to concentrate on the rock formation 
and perhaps the depth of the canyon. Uh, so the emphasis is not the sky. So by making the, the horizon a little higher than center, we really can focus on the main part of the, photogra uh, of the photograph. However, of course, there's always exceptions, right? Always exceptions to the rules. So one of the suggestions from the professionals is if you are going for the symmetry of a reflection, then put that line in the middle uh, so that on one side is uh, the original what you're seeing and directly below it with equal emphasis is the reflection. Now, of course, any of these rules are not hard and fast. Uh, you're the photographer, I'm the photographer, and it's up to us to figure out what it is we want to remember or what feeling or emotion we want to create with our pictures. So for example, if I was out in Montana in big sky country, I might uh, lower that horizon quite a bit to get the big vastness of the blue sky. Now, here's something else to think about. If the sky is dull, oh my goodness, I forgot to delete that picture. All right, stay tuned. I'm going to go back, get rid of that. Whoa, that was a mistake. There we go. If the sky is dull, skip or shrink the horizon. So uh, the picture on the left is taken up in the state of Washington, Orcas Island in the San Juan Islands, and the sky is really not very exciting. Uh, it was very hazy. There were forest fires up in uh, British Columbia and the, the smoke was coming down. And although I was trying to capture the vastness and the openness of this particular beach and the water behind, that sky just really doesn't add anything. So I went in and I cropped it and I cropped most of the sky out. I think I still got a sense of this stony beach and uh, how it extended out towards the water. Uh, so that is again something to think about. If the sky is not adding much to your picture, then minimize it. Uh, you know, if it isn't got that Mediterranean blue or some kind of interesting clouds, whether it be storm clouds gathering in the distance or um, kind of strange formations, then uh, shrink it. Now I did this in Photos app. I didn't think about it when I was taking the, fi the picture, uh, but it was really cool and we're going to look at uh, the Photos app next week on Tuesday and Thursday. You really can uh, make a mediocre picture look much better with a little editing. And there, if I wanted just to concentrate on the stones, uh, I could just do that to look at the variety probably should have gotten a little closer to them all right so let's go on to our next step we're always taking pictures of people we're with whether it be family or friends or perhaps uh, someone interesting on the street so often we see suggestions well try to get something that is candid Unless you're doing a formal portrait headshot, then we pr probably don't want the people or the person looking right at you. So you see on the left, Chris captured his wife, Joan. Joan, by the way, is uh, his cinematographer when he does his cooking shows. He has her looking off probably at a bird, and that picture tells a great story. Notice again, he's using the rule of thirds. She's not right in the middle. Uh, so we see the vastness of Merry Meeting Bay. And we've got a wonderful portrait of Joan. But again, it's telling a story of being out on a kayak and, and enjoying nature. And I'm suspecting that she's watching an eagle uh, circling above. Now, the picture on the right's a little different. Uh, perhaps Chris, if he's on, will put in the comments where this was taken. Uh, that I got a, saw this very interesting person. If you read the sign, it says, Need parts for spaceship trying to get home. 
anything helps will work. And again, this person, he didn't get right in front of her and take a face on. She's gazing off. Um, you kind of get a sense of who she might be or what's going on. And again, it tells a better story than just get grabbing her face straight on. Here's another uh, example of uh, two friends looking uh, not right at me, but off. And I love this picture because I think it captures uh, both their personalities. And uh, I immediately remember when that was taken and where. It's on the Brunswick Mall. And uh, so once again, I didn't say, look at me, take a picture. Instead, I've got uh, Peg looking at her husband and Dawn uh, looking a little bit off into what's going on behind me. So think about that as you're taking pictures, especially boomers and seniors taking lots of pictures of grandchildren. Uh, how can you get them in kind of candid positions so it doesn't look stilted and you don't have to say smile? It also applies to animals. Uh, this guy, if you notice his very full bo uh, belly, had just uh, finished eating. And uh, you can't see it in this picture, but his face was really uh, beat up. I think his dinner fought long and hard before it succumbed. But again, he's gazing off to um, the distance. So think about where you have your subjects look. Now, this is one of my favorite uh, things to do, and I haven't really perfected it yet, but I'm having fun. A lot of these ideas come from a young man named Emil, I won't get his last name, Pac Pacaricus. I'm not sure how to pronounce his last name. Anyway, he is an internet sensation with the iPhone phot photography school. If you go online, uh, he has lots of free videos, but he also offers course. He's quite, he's quite the entrepreneur. But he uh, gave me the idea of using um, bodies of water, windows, and curved glass to take pictures, uh, interesting pictures. Now this picture here, obviously 1902, was not taken with an iPhone. Uh, I just love the picture. That's the Cliff House outside of San Francisco. It's no longer there, but I love the reflection of it in the water and the people there and the reflection of the people and its composition. Again, that Cliff House, which grabs your eye, it's not smack dab in the middle of the picture. It's up there where the two uh, grid lines meet on the right-hand side, and then it's balanced with the rocks. It's just, I think, a stunning example of great composition, but I also love the, re the reflection. So here are his, his hints. Uh, one is to scooch down and hold the iPhone almost in the water when you're taking a picture, whether it be puddle or a fountain. And again, if you watched last week, you know that you can trip your shutter with the volume buttons on your phone. And so you don't have to get an awkward position and try to hit that circle shutter. You can hold the phone in your two hands and use the volume button. Look for interesting perspectives when you're using reflections. And somehow, perhaps combine reality with your reflection so that you see the, the actual thing and um, its reflection. Now this is taken inside a cave in Switzerland. So in the front you see the stones, although they're dark, and then this pool that is reflecting back. Again, the whole point is to have fun. Uh, unless you are going for a professional photography career, uh, most of us are out there just having fun. Now here's an example where scooching down work can work. Now this, the subject is not too, uh, too awe-inspiring, it's simply my neighborhood, but it had been a rainy day, so I went out and I took a picture. You can see that it's fall and I'm looking down the road. And then there was a puddle right in front of me. So I scooched down and right at water level, I took the same picture again. And notice the reflection. I got more um, 
in the picture because I had it on landscape rather than portrait. Now, again, the subject matter doesn't matter. I don't want you to think about the subject matter. I just want you to think about the effect that by scooching down, using the puddle as a reflection, you get a much more interesting picture than the one on the left. Other kinds of things you can do. Again, suggestions from this young man. Use a window. In this case, uh, the deck is on the right. Uh, I put my camera at a right angle, or my phone at a right angle with the uh, lens uh, pointing towards it, and took the picture. So we get the kind of the reflection of this wonderful, comfy looking chairs uh, reflected in the glass. Just kind of a fun way of capturing a particular place. Here's two more. Uh, in this case, one's a planter being reflected in the um, glass uh, barrier between the deck and uh, quite a steep fall. And on the right, getting the duplicate image of a beautiful bouquet of flowers. So think about playing around with uh, reflective services. Now, as I look at the one on the right, I'm thinking, hmm, I need to put that in an editing program. I can get rid of that smoke alarm, and I probably can get rid of the uh, faucet. I'll have to do that. Maybe I'll use that as an example when we get to editing. And here's another example. Uh, this was taken in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, sitting in a restaurant and um, simply shot out the window to capture the lights outside, but you can see it also captured the reflection of the inside of the restaurant. So again, that's kind of a, a fun way to do things. I look at that picture and I immediately remember why I was there, what I was doing, and um, it brings back uh, fun and good memories. Now, you remember that I said he talked about, Emil talked about curved glass. Now these are not stunning pictures at all, but I was just playing around. So this is the back window of my car. And I've got my camera up against, or my, yeah, my iPhone up against it. And I was trying to capture the trees and the woods behind. And you see also I've got a, um, a child swing set. So that's kind of fun. I want to play around with this technique more. Here's another one. Um, this is a uh, what used to be a church. Actually, it's a national landmark in Lisbon Falls now. The Slovaks came over to work in the mills and they had their own um, Orthodox church and it has since been decommissioned and it's now a stained glass studio. Uh, but again, that's the back of my car and I've captured the picture of this old church. And But I also have a little bit of reality um, to the left. So again, it's something fun to play around with. And as I said, I haven't perfected it at all. Uh, I think I'll do some more this summer. Okay, let's move on. Too often, we simply take pictures at either eye level or chest level. Let's think about different perspectives. All right. So this is the Riverwalk in Lisbon Falls. Obviously, it's late fall. Uh, I like this picture. The, the water's blue. The sky is blue. Uh, I like the way the trees kind of frame uh, the, the background. It's taken at chest level. Let's see what it looks like from different perspectives. Same spot, same day, within 10 minutes. All right. This is at waist level. Now, I don't particularly think this is a wonderful picture, and the fact it's not a very good picture at all as far as composition. I mean, it's still pretty with the reflection in the blue water, etc. Uh, but I don't think it gets any points for composition. So look what happens, however, when I go down to water level. I've lost the framing of the trees in front, but now instead there are these beautiful rocks, uh, no doubt left by the glaciers, and they set up I think nicely in the foreground and then we'll cross the river and uh, the barren trees 
in uh, the background. Uh, so that's a, a totally different perspective on this spot from when it was at chest level, uh, chest level. So again, think about how you can uh, position yourself to get different perspectives. So I call it the scooch and the reach. So that beautiful dog, I had to get down and scooch. So I was almost eye level with him. And uh, with the other one, I had to reach, hold my candle up because she was way up high on a piece of a, a playground equipment. So think about scooching and reaching. Now, leaving perspective, let's go to one of my favorite strategies or techniques, which is framing. I love to try to fr frame interesting subjects with something. Now in this case, uh, this is Cinque Terre, Italy, and I'm not sure that it's a particularly wonderful picture, but it was a beautiful sunset and I wanted to capture the clouds and the hills and by now it's almost sunset and the, the trees in front of me were dark, so I framed that sunset with those dark trees. So that's one way to frame a picture. Here are a couple others. Notice on the right that Chris has framed his friend through driftwood. Now Chris is very creative in the way he positions himself and he's much more limber than I am. So I'm sure he's either down on his belly or on his knees and he's captured this wonderful blue sky behind his friend through the driftwood. And he's framed um, this, one, uh, this picture of Dennis uh, in a very interesting way. The one on the left, the framing's a little more uh, subtle, I think, in that he's got those beautiful orange toadstools, and they are framed by the green leafy ferns on the forest floor, but there's also that stick there that kind of draws our eye in. And so another way to frame, thinking creatively. This is more traditional, um, again, Cinque Terre in uh, Italy. Uh, looking out uh, a window to frame um, the hillside, which those are uh, grape vineyards, and um, the beautiful terracotta colors of the houses. So think about framing. It's kind of a fun way to make your pictures more interesting. Now, spring is coming here in Maine. Those of you who might be in warmer parts of the country, I know my sister's in California and the flowers are already out. Here are some tips to think about. First of all, if you're going for wildlife, the wildlife photographers suggest focusing on the eye of your subject. In this case, you notice it's circled in yellow. It's the eye of this beautiful bird and again, once again, the rule of thirds, that eye is very close to the intersection of the grid lines. Think about filling the frame. Uh, that's just the ordinary dandelion, but it looks pretty spectacular when that's all you're looking at. Uh, on, the, on the right is a dahlia. And again, it's filling the frame and you can see the shadows and the different colors and the center, the details of the center. So think about instead of taking the whole plant, filling the frame. Get in close when you're taking flora and fauna. Um, look at this butterfly. Again, Chris is uh, very patient and I think he's very stealthy and can sneak up on these um, little critters. But once again, he got in very close, so not only is it a wonderful picture of the flower, but also of that beautiful butterfly. And going back to um, what we talked about on Tuesday with focus, I'm guessing that he tapped on his screen so the yellow box was right there focused on the butterfly and that flower, and you notice everything else behind it is a little fuzzy and that was the whole point. Here's some more close-ups. Uh, in this case we see a, a spider web 
and uh, again more toadstools. Uh, now if you can't scrunch a selfie stick helps you get low so if you put your phone in a selfie stick and extend it you can hold it down and capture things that are very low to the ground uh, depending which way you uh, have your lens going if you focus it so if you tap it so it's on the selfie lens then you can get right under something like a toadstool and get a great picture here's another Chris one where again he snuck up on this little tree frog but he, again not worried that the uh, parts of the plant are a little fuzzy yellow square was no doubt on that frog and he captured this wonderful picture another technique that professionals use with taking pictures of flowers is called the echo and you notice that it's two flowers of the same kind one behind the other the yellow box has been focused on the one in front so that's sharp but the one behind it is a little fuzzy and so you get the echo here's another trick got this this actually I stole this from Chris is um, bring a spray bottle to make it look like the dawn's dew is fresh on the flowers and you're up at five o'clock in the morning on June 21st uh, no it was the middle of the day I had my spray bottle and uh, I sprayed the flowers and then took the pictures so that's again a, a fun way to give your um, your pictures of flowers or plant some interesting detail. Another thing you can do, especially if you're interested in turning uh, your photographs maybe into cards or, or uh, pictures, have them um, blown up, is you can make your own background with colored paper or cardboard. Let me show you how I did that. Okay, there it is. I was using a blue folder stuck it in the ground in the part of the garden and you see that garden is not particularly attractive right then and there but I got the picture of those little yellow flowers uh, against the blue which made them uh, much more interesting to look at so you can create your own background just be careful you don't step into a hornet's nest another suggestion from uh, the professionals is uh, to focus on the stamen when you're taking pictures of flowers and you can see the examples here uh, when you put that yellow box on the uh, part of the flower that you want really sharp uh, you say, see incredible detail uh, the one in the on the right do you even get a fly uh, notice that the other parts of the picture are fuzzy. Again, that is because you have used the yellow box uh, to pick one part of the image for the camera to really focus on. And here's another, uh, again, a picture of the stamen. Uh, look at the colors. It's such an interesting uh, daylily. It almost looks like velvet. Uh, and those stamen just draw your eye right into the center of that picture. They are kind of like a leading line going into the center. Now we talked about ignoring the horizon or shortening the horizon uh, earlier. And here's another example. So the picture on the left, uh, the water is not particularly uh, attractive or um, eye-catching that day it's not very interesting at all so instead just focused on the plants and not worrying about getting a picture of water in it also so really look at the surroundings look at the sky look at the water is it adding um, drama to your picture if it's not can you cut it out now had that water had it been a day when there were white caps and they were foaming that would have been different but it was just kind of still kind of gray kind of ugh. the other is um, think about unusual perspectives 
Uh, once again, I haven't labeled this, and this is a Chris toy. I think he's using his selfie stick. Maybe not. Maybe he's down on his back. But he's taking a picture of the flower from underneath. And here's another. Now, that looks like a big tree, but it's just a fern. So again, think about your perspective, uh, especially with, uh, again with flora, and uh, look for different ways to pick up patterns and light and detail. Again, another example uh, down very close to the ground, uh, getting the picture of these delicate flowers against the more robust plant in the back. One last thing before we end is to think about the golden hour. And that's the hour after dawn and the hour before sunset. The professionals really like the light at that time. So, of course, if you are just uh, out walking around at noontime, you don't want to say, well, I can't take a picture because it's not the golden hour. But if you're playing around with trying to uh, improve or capture a really uh, gorgeous scene, if you're up early, you might go out and take some pictures. Or uh, if it's sunset, depending on what time of day, <laughs> what time of year, uh, you might think about that hour after dawn and the hour before sunset. So I just want to go over as we end some of the big ideas we talked about today. Uh, first one being use those grid lines to help you utilize the rule of thirds. Find features that draw your viewer into the picture, whether they be leading lines or details or frames. How do you capture viewers eye right off and what draws them into the picture and makes them want to look at it for longer than a second. Don't always take pictures from the chest level. Stretch yourself, scrunch, kneel, whatever you have to do. Sometimes um, lay on your belly or get a selfie stick that will let you uh, point your camera in different positions without uh, creaking your knees. When you're taking those family photos, try to make them look candid by having the folks look somewhere else, you know, say, hey, look, look at that robin everywhere, over there, and snap the picture. Use puddles, reflective surfaces, bodies of water to get a different perspective, just add some interest. So I hope that uh, you've got some ideas to think about as you're out this spring and summer with your iPhone or iPad or even a regular camera or an Android and uh, think about making your pictures more interesting both to you and to your viewer. Tomorrow, Sunday at 2 p.m., Facebook Live, Boomer Tech Adventures Facebook Live. Chef Toy will be in the kitchen. I'm not sure what he's cooking tomorrow, but I'm sure it will be yummy. Thank you for dropping by. Uh, I will be talking Tuesday and Thursday about the photo app and again how you can take a somewhat mediocre picture and make it a stunning picture by using some of the editing apps. Hope you have a good rest of the afternoon, uh, that you're staying healthy and safe, and uh, we hope you check in tomorrow at 2 o'clock. Now you're going to see me uh, escape out of here and go where I end the live video. Bye-bye.